Welcome. My name is Keith Jordan. I'm an associate here at Clinical Financial Partners. We're glad you have chosen to join us today for this clinical forum. I am pleased to introduce our honored guest, Dr. James Hildred. Dr. James Hildred is the 12th president and CEO of Meharry Medical College. He is an infectious disease expert, which is nationally recognized for his leadership in the fight against COVID-19. Dr. Hildred serves on the FDA Vaccine Advisory Committee and the City of Nashville's COVID-19 Task Force. In addition, Meharry manages all of the city's COVID-19 test centers, performing as many as 18,000 tests per week. Dr. Hildred also led the effort to establish Meharry as a COVID-19 vaccine test site as part of Operation Warp Speed. In February of 2021, just last month, Dr. Hildred was selected to serve on President Biden's COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. Dr. Hildred holds a BA degree in chemistry from Harvard University, a PhD in immunology from Oxford University, a medical degree from John Hopkins University School of Medicine. We are grateful to have Dr. Hedrick here with us this morning. And now, Dr. Hedrick, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, and thank you to Rob McCabe, Chairman, for the invitation to speak with you today. And I want to give a special shout out to Nicole Dunnigan, who uh, yeah. serves as our banker for Phyllis and I. She's just been a tremendous uh, friend and, and, and done great things for us. So. I'm happy to, to share with you some thoughts about COVID-19. If I can just share my screen with you all, I will uh, get my talk started. So first, there's a disclaimer that some of the images in my talk are protected by copyright and I'm using them because I'm doing education and that's why they're available to me. I wanna say a word about Meharry Medical College. We've been around since 1876. Uh, our mission is to provide uh, health services to the underserved and to train healthcare workers who are have a desire to do the same. And we're very proud of our legacy of mission and service. And our motto is worship of God through service to mankind. And we try to live out that legacy each and every day, uh, the students, faculty, staff, all of us. But today I want to give you an overview of COVID-19. I'm going to talk about the virus the disease that it causes and vaccines that represent the solution for us to get this behind us. So the virus is SARS-CoV-2. It's a member of the human coronavirus family. And the viruses on the right, these four viruses here, are they cause a common cold. They've been around since the early 1960s. And in fact, it's not uncommon for children to get infected by one or more of these um, in a season, um, and it wouldn't be unusual for that to happen. The three viruses on the left are those that are associated with pandemics, and there have been three pandemics caused by coronaviruses since 2003. The first was SARS, uh, the second was MERS in 2012, and of course, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 in December of last of 2019. One of the things that you should know is that there are lots of members of the coronavirus family. There are more than 30 members of the family. They're endemic to bats, uh, which means there's other ways to potential for another pandemic to occur. But you need to understand that for SARS in 2003 and MERS in 2012, there was an intermediate host. The virus went from bats into these animals and then from those animals into humans. And so this is an example of what is called a zoonotic transmission or zoonosis. When a virus goes from an animal into a human, we refer to that as a zoonotic transmission. The best known example of this is bird flu, in which people get a strain of influenza only if they come into contact with, with birds. The difference between uh, SARS and SARS-CoV-2 is that the natural host is a bat we don't know what the intermediate host was, but the virus got into an intermediate host and then made its way into humans. The main difference between the previous viruses I shared with you is that once this virus got into human beings, it adopted itself for human to human transmission. So now rather than animals being the vector for transmission, humans became the vector. And once humans became the vector, that's when the virus spread so rapidly around the globe because we took the virus with us wherever we went. 
and all the interactions we had would spread the virus. So there was a zoonotic transmission that occurred originally, but then it adopted for human to human transmission. The other thing that's of paramount importance for SARS-CoV-2 is that it's a truly airborne pathogen. What that means is the particles that this virus are, are part of are so small that just a normal conversation without coughing or sneezing or yelling is sufficient to propel the virus into the air and it can remain in the air for several minutes, um, as long as half an hour, and as far away as 20 to 30 feet. So what that means is that when a person who's infected has a normal conversation in an with an individual for more than about 10 minutes, that counts as an exposure to the virus. So the fact that SARS-CoV-2 is an airborne pathogen is critical to our understanding of how we control it. It also explains why masks are so very important. This is an illustration from the CDC showing how this works. The woman at the top on the left is infected. She's asymptomatic, unaware of the fact that she's infected. She's having a conversation with two of her friends. One of them is wearing a mask, the other are not wearing a mask. The woman on the right without the mask is being maximally exposed to the virus, whereas the woman wearing the mask is protected. At the bottom, it shows you what happens when masks are worn. If the woman who is infected wears the mask, it greatly reduces the amount of particles that are being projected into the air. And if the person she's speaking with is wearing a mask, it reduces the likelihood that those few particles will reach her. So the maximum protection against SARS-CoV-2 is when everyone is wearing a mask. Because in that case, it doesn't matter who the infected person is, the transmission cycle can be interrupted. And the fact that the virus is truly airborne is why we have to wear the mask as illustrated in this uh, cartoon. So let's talk about how viruses are transmitted. Viruses are incomplete life forms. They do not have the machinery they need inside of the particles to replicate. So they have to get inside of a cell and take advantage of the machinery inside the cell. This is achieved by the virus binding to a receptor on the surface of the cell. The virus particle then fuses, literally fuses to the membrane of the cell and injects its contents into the cell. But the key thing to know is that this is all mediated by the binding of a protein on the virus to a protein on the surface of the cell. And these are referred to as virus receptors. This is un important to understand why SARS-CoV-2 causes such widespread and uh, so much disease. So, for example, HIV only infects cells in the immune system because only cells in the immune system have the receptor for that virus. Imagine having a virus now that has receptors all over the body. The receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is in the heart, it's in the lungs, it's in blood vessels, it's in the kidneys, it's in our gut, and you may not know this, it's also in testes. So the reason why this virus is able to cause such widespread disease where people are having uh, strokes and heart attacks and other kinds of manifestations, getting pericarditis, is because the virus has access to all of these different tissues. And that explains why the disease spectrum is so broad for uh, COVID-19. So let's talk about the disease. So there are three stages of disease caused by SARS-CoV-2. Uh, there's the pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic phase, symptomatic, the late phase when people get really sick. So first let's talk about when the virus first infects us. The virus gains access through our nose and our mouth. It replicates in the back of our nose, the back of our throat. But at that point, it's not causing many different, uh, many challenges for us. And that is a pre-symptomatic, asymptomatic infection. But the fact that there's enough virus being made in those tissues is important because the virus can still be transmitted. And that's important because that accounts for the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic transmission because there's enough virus being made in the upper respiratory tract to allow it to be transmitted. When the virus makes its way down into our lungs, it starts to infect the cells in our lungs. 
and destroys the tissues in our lungs. What you need to know is that in addition to the virus destroying our tissues, the immune response to the virus is probably causing more damage than the virus is because the inflammatory cells that come into our lungs, they release these chemical signals called cytokines that recruit more cells, they li liquids accumulate, we get blood clots, and the net result is breathing becomes an enormous challenge and it is why uh, people die because eventually the lungs shut down. And it's why we also use anti-inflammatories like steroids to treat the disease because of the inflammation that the virus causes in our system. Just a couple of words about the pandemic. I just wanna make the point that we've now reached a level of infection, 115 million people around the world, two and a half million people have died. This means that the COVID-19 pandemic is now on the same level and scale as the pandemic of 1918. I'm pointing this out because in 1918, there were no infectious disease doctors, no ventilators, no ICUs, no antibiotics, no antiviral drugs. So imagine 100 years later, with all the technology and expertise we have, the pandemic has reached the same levels it did in 1918. That makes some serious statements about where, how we've handled this. Uh, here in the United States, we are we're only 4.7% of the global population, but we account for 25% of the cases. It is an understatement to say that at least early on, the pandemic was handled very poorly on a national level. And we have two premier organizations of their kind in the planet, the CDC and the FDA and they were handcuffed by politics, and this was a huge, huge problem. But one of the things that should also be known and acknowledged is the global scientific response has been unprecedented. You had collaborations between scientists in different countries like we've never seen before. And many scientists who worked on other things put their own research on pause to join the fight against uh, COVID-19. And also something we've never seen before is having big drug companies actually collaborate to find a solution uh, to the problem. A great recent example of that is Merck, who dropped their own attempts to produce a vaccine. They're gonna help Johnson & Johnson produce their vaccine that was recently approved for emergency use by the FDA. As of uh, yesterday, uh, there have been almost 28 million cases diagnosed in the United States. And you should know that for every case that's diagnosed by a PCR test, we believe there are at least three or four cases that go undetected because those individuals never present themselves for testing or to the healthcare system, which means that the actual number of infections in the United States might be north of 100 million. And we've all seen the headlines that now more than 518,000 people have died of COVID-19 in the United States, and that's 20% of the total for the whole globe. Uh, and I just wanna make this last point. If we'd had a coordinated mitigation strategy where all of us did the same things at the same time and focus on the most vulnerable populations, tens of thousands of people who are dead would still be with us today. One observation that was made in China early on in all of this is that seven out of 10 people who died in China from COVID-19 had a pre-existing comorbid condition. They had high blood pressure, diabetes, ischemic heart disease, asthma. They had suffered a stroke, they had congestive heart failure. So 70% of the people who died had one or more of these conditions. And that predicted that here in the United States, and let me point out that China is a racially homogeneous nation. So, which makes these observations even more compelling, right? That among a racially homogeneous uh, nation of more than a billion people, 70% of the people who died shared in common that they suffered from one of these conditions. If you come over to the United States, what does that mean for us? We know that African Americans and Hispanics have a much higher rate of all of these things compared to the white population here in this country. And for that reason, it was predicted and predictable that minority populations would have a disproportionate burden 
of COVID-19 disease and death. For all of the things that we reference, cardiovascular disease, half of African-Americans have some form of, of cardiovascular disease or, or condition. A third of us are hypertensive. Uh, obesity is something that's very significant in our populations, diabetes, cancer. So if you look at what's happening here in the United States, it's not a surprise that we, we see things like this. These are data from la late last summer, but it hasn't changed very much. From Louisiana, Michigan, Illinois, and North Carolina. Louisiana, of course, is New Orleans, Michigan, Detroit, Illinois, Chicago. And the, dif the difference in death rates for minorities, in this case, African-Americans and, and whites, is quite profound. As a matter of fact, in Detroit, in late last summer, there was a 10 to 1 ratio, almost a 10 to 1 ratio of death rates among African-Americans compared to whites. In New Orleans, it was 5 to 1. In uh, Chicago, 6 to 1. So uh, it's an understatement to really to say that there's been a disproportionate burden of disease and death for minorities in the United States because of COVID-19. The other thing I want to briefly touch on is something we've all heard a lot about uh, is herd immunity. Herd immunity is a, a phrase or a term that comes from agriculture in the 1910s, 1916, I think is the first time the phrase was used. It turned out that that there was a virus causing spontaneous abortions in cattle and sheep. And these uh, the veterinarians noticed that once the virus once the spontaneous abortions had occurred in a significant number of the animals, they stopped and the animals that were surviving were immune to further infections. And they referred to that as herd immunity, that at some point the infections would stop because the animals that were still there had been infected and immune to it. So in humans, what that means is we have these three stick figures. The blue are not immunized and they're healthy. The orange are immunized and healthy, and the red are people who are infected and contagious, and they've not been immunized. So on the far left, you see we have two folks who are infected, they're contagious. Everyone around them is not immune. The virus quickly spreads through the population, such that 90% of the people here uh, are now infected by the virus, starting with two individuals, right? In the middle shows you that some People have the immunity, not everyone, but a few people do. They tend to be protected, but everyone else in the crowd in this community gets infected. The real magic is over on the far right, that when 70 or 80% of these individuals are orange or immune, there's very little, little opportunities for the virus to spread. In this case, everyone around this individual in their infectious circle or, or cycle or opportunity they're already immune to it, so the virus has nowhere to go. This person will either recover, get treated and recover, or die from infection. But the point is, the virus will not go beyond this person because all the people around them are immune to it. So when we talk about herd immunity, we're talking about achieving a level of immunity in our community such that the infected persons cannot spread the virus to anyone else. And that is the idea behind herd immunity. Uh, here in the United States, some had suggested early on that we achieve herd immunity by letting the virus run its course through our population. That would mean that 300 million people in this country would be infected. And based on the fatality rate that this virus has, somewhere between 6 and 8 million people would die. That's certainly not a price we want to pay to achieve herd immunity. So vaccines are the alternative way to do this. And in order to achieve herd immunity with vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, given the transmission rate that it has, somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the population need to be vaccinated in order for us to achieve herd immunity. But we had to make sure that the vaccines worked in vulnerable populations, including older individuals. They have to be safe because we're giving them to tens of millions of people, so safety is paramount. And because of the disproportionate burden that minority populations have for disease and death, we had to make sure they were included in the trials. And the reason for that is across races and genders, continents, and across time, the human genome 
is pretty much identical in all of us. But there are some subtle differences in the genes in our immune systems that make us respond differently. For example, African Americans are much more likely to be allergic to peanuts compared to whites. Conversely, whites are more likely to be allergic to animal dander than African Americans are or blacks. And allergies are a manifestation of our immune systems. And that's just one simple illustration that even though our genomes are virtually identical, our immune systems are not. And the only way to make sure a vaccine works in a population, they must be part of the trials of those vaccines. And that's why such an emphasis was placed on getting minority participation in the vaccine trials. What vaccines are purposed to do is the following. I share with you that viruses get into our cells by having an attachment protein bind to a receptor. What vaccines are designed to do is to generate antibodies, which are large proteins that will bind to the attachment proteins on the virus, cover them up, and create a physical barrier between the virus and the receptor. We refer to these as neutralizing antibodies. So the goal of all the vaccines that you've heard about and that we read about is to make neutralizing antibodies that block infection. So I wanna to briefly touch on the three platforms that are being used for virus production. There's actually a fourth, but that's not being done in this country. They are, the first thing and the oldest and tried and true method is we take a piece of the virus, in this case, the spike protein, the attachment protein, we purify it, we mix it with an adjuvant that enhances the immune response. We inject that into individuals that make an antibody to the protein. The Novavax vaccine is an example of this approach. The second approach is we take a common cold virus called an adenovirus, we inactivate it so it can still go into our cells, but it cannot replicate. And we actually modify the genome of the adenovirus so that now part of the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is in the adenovirus. In other words, we've made a hybrid virus. It is adenovirus, but it expresses the proteins of SARS-CoV-2, in this case, the spike protein. So we infect individuals with the virus. It's not replicating. It's just delivering the gene. We make the protein. We make antibodies to it. The vaccine has done its job. The third platform, which we've all heard about, and these are the first two vaccines to be approved, is messenger RNA. So you can think of the genes in our bodies as the permanent blueprints for every protein in our body as a gene. Those genes are locked away safely in our, in our nuclei of our cells. But the working copies of those blueprints are messenger RNAs. They are the blueprint to make proteins, all the proteins in our bodies are coded for by mRNA. So we deliver the mRNA into the body, the protein gets made by our own cells, our, antibody, our immune system sees the proteins make antibodies. And so all three platforms that are being used here in this country have the same purpose, to expose our immune system to the spike protein, to allow antibodies to be made. They all do it in a, in a different way, but they all have that same purpose. This just shows you uh, the six companies that are making vaccines and, and the way they started. The reason why Moderna and Pfizer were first across the finish line, their trials started first of all of these back in July. And there are six companies doing six trials uh, and each of them had as its purpose to enroll 30,000 participants at a minimum. 15,000 would get the vaccine candidate, 15,000 get a placebo, and once 150 endpoints had been achieved, that is 150 people diagnosed with COVID-19, you would stop, not stop the trials, but collect the data and analyze the data and see how well the vaccines have worked. So this is the, the really the scheme for all of these. So AstraZeneca is using uh, adenovirus. Johnson & Johnson is using adenovirus. Novavax and Sanofi are doing the the spike protein approach that I shared with you. So let's, what is in the vaccines? Let's talk about Pfizer Moderna first. What you see in front of you is the sum total of everything that's in that bio. There's a short piece of mRNA that encodes the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. There are some lipids, charged and neutral lipids, including cholesterol. 
they form the shell around the mRNA. There's some inorganic buffer salts to maintain the pH. There's sugar, sucrose, and water. That is all that's in that vial. There are no microchips to, fall, to trace you. If you're worried about being traced with microchips, put your phone away. That's where those chips are. There are no preservatives. There are no heavy metals, no cellular products, no animal products. And one of the attractive things about the mRNA vaccines is these are chemically well-defined vaccines. The mRNA is a chemical. Everything else in this list is a chemical that can be purified and made highly pure, but that's all that's in the vial. Here's the study design for Moderna and, and Pfizer. They're both pretty much the same. Two injections, 21 days apart for Pfizer, 28 days apart for Moderna. Uh, as you see, we have a 30,000 enrollees, have to get the placebo, have to get the mRNA. They get injected on day one and day 29. For days one through eight, they keep a journal to record their whatever reactions they're going to have. Same thing after the second injection for seven days, they keep a journal. Actually, it's a phone app they use to record their reactions. But I want to, you to notice that the trials go on for two years. So we can understand how long the immunity lasts, but also to look for long-term consequences related to the vaccine. Why are there two injections? Well, prior to November of last of 2019, no human being alive had ever been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus, which means that as a species, we were totally naive in terms of immunity to that virus. So the first time you see it, you make something called a primary immune response. This is true for anything we get exposed to. The very first time we see it, our body gets exposed to it, we make a primary immune response. It lasts for a few weeks. We get some antibodies made. We make these large IgMs. These are huge antibodies with low affinity, and they're not very effective at fighting viruses. We make some IgGs. These are smaller. They bind with high affinity. These are the, vir the antibodies we want to make to protect ourselves against the virus. So we make this primary response, and that's what happens when you get your first injection. The real magic happens the second time you see that very same thing. You make what's called a secondary immune response. It can be orders of magnitude, 100-fold, 1,000-fold, even 10,000-fold stronger than a primary response. You make lots of these really desirable antibodies called IgGs or gamma globulins. They bind tightly. They they have a half-life measured in weeks, and there's a lot of them. But the real secret sauce of the secondary response is that we make something called memory cells, memory immune cells. Memory cells are required for long-lasting immunity. The reason why we have immunity to measles for life from the measles vaccine that we get is that it induces huge numbers of memory cells so that one vaccine we get to measles is enough to protect us for our whole lives because of the memory cells. And secondary immune responses are very, very good at generating memory cells. So that second shot from Moderna and Pfizer, they're very, very important. This just shows you how effective these vaccines are. The lower blue line shows you the response or number of cases over time with vaccine recipients. The gray line shows you that over time in the controls, cases continue to accumulate. This is a very dramatic illustration of just how well these vaccines work. And for Pfizer and Moderna, the data from the trials are virtually superimposable. They're the same vaccine for the most part. Uh, they're given by the same protocol for the most part, two doses, 28 days apart. The efficacies are remarkably similar, 95% versus 94.5%. But the thing that's really important to know is both of these vaccines were virtually offered virtually complete protection against hospitalization and death, right? No one who got the vaccines had to be hospitalized. No one who got the vaccines died of COVID-19. And from my perspective as a scientist, to see these two large sets of data that are virtually superimposable reinforces the quality of the science because these two studies confirm each other, which gave us even more confidence uh, in, in the results. So I'm on the panel at FDA that reviews the vaccines for approval. 
we met in December to review these two uh, data for these two vaccine trials. We voted to approve them for EA, EUA, EUA use. Let me explain that these vaccines got what's called emergency use authorization. They did not get full approval as vaccines. And EUAs are issued when there's a national crisis for which there's no medicine or drug available to deal with it. And that was certainly the case for COVID-19. So these two vaccines have been given EUAs, not full approval, but both Moderna and Pfizer expect to file for a complete approval in May or so. Uh, and you, you need to know so about another committee at the CDC called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. This is an outside group of experts who make recommendations about who should get the vaccines and when they should get them. So ACIP prioritized healthcare workers and people living in assisted living facilities as the first recipients of vaccines. In case you're wondering, that's where that recommendation came from. But last week we met again, uh, the FDA committee met again to review the Janssen, Johnson & Johnson vaccine there was a unanimous vote to recommend EUA approval for that vaccine. So now we have three vaccines available. So what is in the J&J &J vaccine? Here's the sum total of everything that's in that vaccine. We got the inactivated adenovirus, common cold virus that expresses the SARS-CoV-2 gene. We have some buffer salts, some lipids again and buffer salts. We have some salt here, sodium hydroxide and sodium chloride. These are two salts and some acids to adjust the pH, a tiny amount of hydrochloric acid to adjust the pH. That's all that's in this, in that vial. No animal products, no cellular products, no heavy metals, no microchips. This is all that's in the vial. The way this vaccine works is we have this adenovirus, a common cold virus. It binds to our cells, delivers the gene for the spike protein. The protein gets made, gets taken up by cells in our immune system. Antibodies are made that will neutralize the virus. And that is how this uh, vaccine works. The J&J &J vaccine offers some very substantial advantages compared to the Moderna vaccines. The Moderna vaccine and Pfizer vaccines have to be stored at minus 94 degrees which requires a special supply chain, special storage conditions, which means that only selected facilities can give those vaccines. In contrast, the J&J &J vaccine can be stored for months at a time in a refrigerator. It can be frozen for two years without losing its activity. And this alone offers some huge advantages over the Moderna uh, and Pfizer vaccines. They can also be prepared on a large scale you should know that this platform that J&J &J is using, they've used it for multiple other vaccine trials, and there's a vaccine for Ebola that uses this uh, platform that's been approved in Europe. So there's a lot of experience with this vaccine platform, and because of that, they can scale up to production very quickly. They expect to have 100 million doses available uh, by the middle of May or so. And also, because of what I've shared with you, you can use the existing supply chain infrastructure to get it to where it needs to be. This is just a, a same analysis I showed you how the study goes. Vaccinated on day one, for the first seven days, uh, people keep a journal to say what the reactions have been. Uh, and then they will also follow these individuals for two years to look for how long the immunity lasts, but also to look for uh, adverse events that might happen in the longer term. And I should say that uh, this trial en enrolled even larger numbers of people than the first two trials did. Almost 44,000 people took part in the J&J &J trial in, oh, in three continents in multiple countries. So here's the summary of the uh, data for the J&J &J vaccine. The efficacy overall for moderate to severe disease across all countries after two weeks after vaccination was 66%. And the first reaction to this was, well, this is much less effective than Moderna and Pfizer. This vaccine is not as good. That's not the right message to take. Here in the United States, the efficacy was 72% against moderate to severe disease. And that was across all the populations, black, white, old, young, disease or no disease. 
But what I really want you to pay attention to is that this vaccine, like Moderna and Pfizer, offered complete total protection against hospitalizations and deaths. Okay, I just need to say that again. <laughs> that this vaccine on three continents, in places where the variants were highly prevalent, offered complete, complete protection against hospitalizations and death. And that's what we, sh we should be focused on. Not to mention it's a single shot, which makes the logistics of mask vaccination much simpler than two shots, along with the storage conditions I've already mentioned. So one question I've been asked over and over again is, Dr. Hildreth, how can we believe that the vaccines are safe since they were developed so fast? And there are a lot of things I could point to, but I want to focus on three things. It's true that vaccines take a long time. The longest one took 100 years. The fastest one took four years, that was Ebola. So how, was, how is it that we developed a vaccine in 10 months? Three things I want to point out, among others I could point out. First is technology. The technology brought to bear on COVID-19 is unprecedented, and that's not an exaggeration. We've never had the kind of technology we have now. Molecular genetics, big data, molecular modeling, high throughput assays, they were all brought to bear in this. Let me give you one example. The genome for SARS-CoV-2 was published in full on January the 10th. By February the 10th, three companies had already identified vaccine candidates. That process alone normally takes two years, maybe a year, but normally two years. So a process that takes two years was achieved in one month because of technology. The other thing is that vaccine development is typically an iterative process. You do one step, followed by another step, followed by another step. Because of the enormous resources that were made available to the drug companies, they ran some of these processes in parallel. So rather than waiting to see the outcome of step A before you start step B, they would run some of these steps in parallel, which also compressed the time frame because they had the resources made available to them to do that. The third thing is infrastructure. For the last 30 years, we've been trying to develop a vaccine for HIV. And for a lot of reasons, HIV has proven to be impossible to develop a vaccine for. But in the effort to develop the vaccine, an amazing infrastructure has been created around the world. And that includes scientists, facilities, protocols, technologies, and what happened last March, February, March, is the infrastructure for HIV was put on hold and its attention was turned to COVID-19. So having this amazing global infrastructure for vaccine development that could just on a dime stop and focus on COVID-19 also play a huge role in getting us the vaccine so quickly. Another question I'm frequently asked, particularly by people of color is, uh, Dr. Hildreth, we, we can't trust the vaccines, we think about Tuskegee and eugenics where brown and black women were involuntarily sterilized. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things that make us wary of all of this. And I acknowledge that, that there's reason for some people in our population to be, to be reserved and hesitant, but this is very different. Uh, starting at all levels, at all levels of the vaccine development, people of color have been involved starting with my colleague here, my young colleague, this brilliant young scientist, Dr. Corbett. Her research played a pivotal role in developing the platforms for mRNA vaccines, and that needs to be acknowledged. When vaccine trials are underway, there's something called a data safety monitoring board. It's a group of totally independent scientists and experts. They get to review the data on a real-time basis. Whenever they want to see it, they can see it. If they have any safety signals, that, that's what we call it, that the participants are in jeopardy of being harmed, they can stop the trial. And several persons of color, African American and Hispanic, have been involved in data safety monitoring boards, including my friend, Dr. Lisa Cooper, who's a professor at Johns Hopkins. Then once the trials are over, the FDA has to review them for approval. And two African Americans, including myself, we serve on the committee at the FDA that approves the vaccines. So this is very different from past uh, research where African-Americans were the subjects but not able to control it or be a part of the leadership of it. So I tell people that this is very different uh, from, from past. 
One thing I also want to touch on quickly is variants. Um, you should know that all RNA viruses, HIV, coronaviruses, influenza, every virus that uses RNA as a genome, they will mutate and change. They do it as a part of trying to escape our immune system. We call those escape mutants. And as long as the virus has a chance to replicate, it can mutate and variants can arise. So the sooner we stop the virus from spreading, the lower the risk will be that variants will arise. And because the virus is in so many places and not being controlled very well, it is not a surprise that so many variants have arisen so quickly. So let me just explain how variants occur. So the first thing to know is that the genome for SARS-CoV-2 is itself a messenger RNA. So as soon as it gets inside of our cells, a protein is made that's encoded by the genome called a polymerase. The single job of this polymerase is to start copying the genome and making thousands and thousands and thousands of copies of it, okay? So in order for the virus to replicate, it needs some genomes to package, right? So this protein has the responsibility of making those genomes, but it makes mistakes. It'll put the wrong uh, alphabet, so to speak, in the chain, and so the sequence has changed. And when you're making thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of copies of something, it's not surprising that mistakes will be made. So you need to think about mRNAs as being a string of barcodes that tell the protein machinery which amino acids to stick together. So these codons are like barcodes and they tell the system which amino acids. So for example, this short bit of it are mRNA encodes for valine attached to alanine, attached to glutamic acid, attached to glycine. But if a mistake is made and this G is changed to an A, now instead of glutamic acid, it's a lysine. So whenever an mRNA is poorly copied, and one of these positions is changed, you can change the amino acid sequence, right? So why is that important? So let's say we have a hypothetical protein and we have two amino acids to look at here. One is lysine, lysine has a positive charge, glutamic acid has a negative charge. So they will come together because they form what is called a salt bridge because opposite charges attract. So you literally cause a fold to be made in the protein because of these amino acids. And that fold can be recognized by an antibody. But what happens if there's a mutation? We change this adenine to a cytosine. So now we have a different barcode. And instead of glutamic acid, we have alanine. Alanine has no charge. And now the salt bridge falls apart and the antibody has nothing to bind to. So the real danger in mutations is that the call variants and some variants can change the shape of the protein and antibodies that used to bind no longer bind. And that's the biggest danger with variants for SARS-CoV-2, that a change will happen that causes the antibodies that we've made to no longer bind to, to the proteins. And that's why we have to be concerned about variants. The good news is that it mutate, so this is the genome of SARS-CoV-2, this long strand, st strand of RNA. It's really a messenger RNA. And these are showing two point mutations that have been made. We've changed two positions in the genome. And this is a spike protein. These two changes can change the shape of the spike protein. So there's some antibodies that used to bind no longer bind. The good news is that since the vaccine itself is an mRNA, we can simply change the sequence of our vaccine to match the sequences in the virus. And now the protein that we make from the vaccine is exactly matched to the protein in the variant and it, the vaccine should work again. And when you hear about the companies making booster shots with the mRNA vaccines, this is what they're doing. They're changing the sequence in the vaccine to exactly match the sequence in the variants in the viruses. The good news about the variants is they're not magical viruses. They get transmitted the same way that the original strains do. What that means is that masks will control the variants like they do the original strains. Hand washing and sanitizer will kill them. So all the things that we've been doing to keep the original strains under control will also control the variants. So we need to keep doing those things we've been doing to minimize the spread of, of uh, of variants. So a few closing thoughts. The world is dealing with a once in a century pandemic. We hope it's once in a century pandemic. 
uh, some exceptional, some really exceptional science has brought provided us with vaccines in record time. We need a nationally coordinated response uh, and vaccine distribution plan, and thankfully now we're getting that. Uh, COVID-19 is exposed for everyone to see some pre-existing health inequities in our country uh, that have been around for a long, long time. It's going to require some real work to, to change that. And I think the pandemic has also exposed just how unready we were, unprepared we were to deal with a public health crisis. And I hope that one of the things that will come out of this is that this will be the last time we're so unprepared for a public health crisis. Because as I shared with you, there are 37, 39 members of the coronavirus family out there in those bats. And at any time, they can jump into an animal and then jump into us. So I don't think this will be the last pandemic we'll deal with. And so we got to be better prepared next time. And with that, I'll stop and take, take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hendry. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, I tell you, you do such a great job of explaining what I consider to be a complex subject, COVID-19, but you explain it in such a way that it's easy to understand and easy to follow. And so I truly appreciate that. Thank you. Um, while you were speaking, we had a, have a few questions that come in. And we're going to take the time and go over some of these questions. Uh, the first question is, how does the United States approach of state and local responsibility to distribute vaccines compared to other countries around the world, both in the approach itself and in the outcomes? Can you talk to that? So I think that that's a very good question and a very relevant question. Um, the, pandemic, the pandemic response itself is a reflection of having a collection of 50 states that can do what they want to do despite the recommendations that are made by our public agencies. And the same thing is happening with the vaccine distribution. The CDC can make recommendations, but it's up to the 50 governors to decide, along with their health, health leaders, what they're gonna do. And that's been a problem because to save the most lives from COVID-19, we should vaccinate the most vulnerable first. And that has to be an intentional, purposeful thing that we decide to do. But unfortunately, politics and race become a part of the conversation and that's complicated things for us. So it is different here in the United States in places where there's more centralized control of public health measures. It's easier to do these things, uh, but I'm hoping that we can overcome that and that as we move forward, the supply itself will solve the problem. Once there's enough supply, for everybody get vaccinated all at once. I think this will be less of a problem, but it's an excellent question and the uh, the 50 different approaches have been a problem from the very beginning. That's 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 for sure. Gotcha. Um, got several more questions. Here's another one here. Should we have more people distributing the vaccine? Um, is a physician assistant or med tech capable of administering vaccine? Um, and also, will there be a quick certification program for that? Another great question. Uh, once the millions and millions of doses that we expect come on come online, our problem won't be vaccine supply. It's going to be the vaccinators. So you raise an excellent point. We need to start training up non-licensed healthcare providers to do the vaccinations under the supervision of licensed healthcare providers. I would argue that medical students, nursing students, even dental students, lab techs, uh, pharmacy technicians. All of them have capability of injecting the vaccine into arms. It's not a technically challenging thing to do. As a matter of fact, diabetics give themselves shots all the time. I mean, it happens millions of times around the world. So I think we have to do that. It's an excellent point. And I'm hoping that here in Tennessee and elsewhere, the governors will decide to allow certification of non licensed practitioners to give the vaccines. It's going to be necessary once the tens of millions of doses we're expecting to be available become available. Yes, I agree. I think it will be very helpful to have that taking place. And um, so another question, and this is here, uh, I'm sure you may have get this a lot. Um, I even hear it myself, and that is, at what point in the vaccine distribution do you believe it would be safe to start wearing masks? Um, <laughs> is it at full herd immunity? And is herd immunity achievable given the constant mutation of the virus? Another excellent question. 
So here's something to understand about the vaccines. The vaccine trials were designed to answer a very specific question, which is, do the vaccines block disease? Not do they block infection, but do they block disease? So we don't know with certainty that those persons who are vaccinated cannot become infected and become a vector for the virus. We don't have that answer yet. All of the companies are going back to ask that question. And that is why we're advising people that even after being vaccinated, we want you to continue to wear your mask because you might become an unwitting vector of the virus. You can get infected, have no symptoms because you've been vaccinated, but able to transmit the virus to someone else. Until we have an answer to that question, the advice is that we still wear our mask until everyone's or at least herd immunity has been achieved. And there's some debate about whether or not that's 70% of the people or 80%. The short answer is we should all keep wearing masks until there's a high level of confidence that herd immunity has been achieved. And as I said before, even with the variants out there, we keep doing the things that we need to do to protect ourselves, the masks, social distancing, avoiding crowds. The, the variants are important, but they only become important if we allow them to spread. So we can, if we can control them until everyone's vaccinated, we can actually achieve herd immunity despite the variants. My real concern is, uh, not to go too far off point, you might have heard stories that some countries that have poorly resourced might not get the vaccines for another two years or longer. We need to understand that the, the world has become a small place and until everyone on the globe is protected, none of us are. Because imagine this, in those countries where the virus is able to, to, to spread freely, a variant may arise for which the vaccines are not effective, which means that then all of us are once again susceptible to infection. If we don't vaccinate the whole planet, and what I'm trying to say is that the highly resourced countries should buy the vaccine and give it to the low resource countries. It's in our best interest to do so. Because if the virus is not controlled in those places, a variant may arise, and it's a disaster scenario that the vaccines have no effect against, and the world will be starting all over again. So it's in everyone's best interest that we vaccinate the whole planet as quickly as possible. Thank you for that answer. That's very clear, and I appreciate you explaining it that way. Um, another question to come in, can you comment on the status of the pediatric vaccine trials? So the pedi pediatric vaccine trials are getting underway. We're going to be doing a pediatric vaccine trial here at Meharry for the Moderna vaccine. Uh, the goal is to enroll a few thousand children across the country. And this is always the way this works. You prove that a vaccine is safe in adults, any medicine for that matter, prove that it's safe in healthy adults. And then you do what are called bridging studies in pregnant women and uh, children. So we think that in the next few months, it's going to take a couple of months to get the data, that we'll have the data we, we, we need for children. And there's every expectation that it's going to be safe in children and in pregnant women. Great. Thank you. Well, Dr. Hendry, we truly appreciate you joining us today, providing that great information and your sharing your knowledge on COVID-19. Uh, I have learned a lot listening to you. And again, I appreciate the way you took this information, so complex information, made it so simple to understand. And I want you to know that you are our honored guest, and we truly appreciate you for you being here with us today. And we would like to thank all of you for joining us today for this clinical forum. We'll be hosting more of these events throughout the year. If you are interested in joining others, please ask your financial advisor to keep you posted on the speakers and topics that we have coming up. Thank you again. Thank you, Keith. Thank you.